Okay, this is going to be the ninth chapter of I Was For Sale. Let me get my shawl on here because it's very cold in this room. All right. And the creation book fraud story continues to develop, www.creationbooksfraud.com. This is from Chapter 3, The Professor. Fred put a chain and leash around me. I was lightly bound, and the writer led me around for some photos. The Gibson girl hairstyle was my thing at the time. I went often to an old Polish beautician in my East Village neighborhood for lacquered bouffant hairdos. As they slowly got messed up over the course of the following week, I'd sweep up the huge mass of ratted hair and give myself a sort of punk Gibson girl quaff. I thought it looked really cool with my black leather motorcycle jacket. The writer soon tired of the relationship, the threesome. I'm not a pimp, he declared, which struck me as very weird since it was he who had introduced me to a male client and took a small fee each time. The male client had a sexual urge. That was the only reason initially for the meetings. Isn't that pimping? I think so. We went down to the basement of Fred's suburban house. Most of the curtains had been carefully closed. In future years, Fred was less clandestine, and I enjoyed sitting on his back porch, wearing one of his wife's robes, and watching the spiders spin their webs in the dewy evenings while I sipped pear brandy. You'll get sick, Fred cautioned. My feet were bare. I'd smoke pot out on the porch, which didn't bother him as much as my bare feet propped up in the cool air. I'm already sick, I'd reply. He'd just shake his head and go back in the house. Of course, I fell in love with Fred, though it was a bizarre type of love since we'd never made out or had normal intercourse and he's 39 years my senior. Our birthdays are close to each other. We're both Gemini. I stayed over at his house for many weekends, modeling a little and doing some secretarial work, never raising my price. Someone very famous in Hollywood, where Fred had worked after the Second World War, had taught him how to make perfect scrambled eggs, so I was always hungry for breakfast at the professor's creepy old house. We also carefully reserved a glass of champagne for my breakfast, maybe even half an eclair. He'd drive me to the train station in Chappaqua, and I'd catch the express train to my jobs in Midtown, already missing Fred, wishing those 39 years of age difference between us weren't there at all. Fred turned out to be perhaps my steadiest client for 20 years at least. He's about 80, and I fear I will lose him soon. He has cancer. He did die in 1999. Every time he calls me in Europe and I hear his voice, I thank God he is still independent. I saw him in person recently, and he looked great and seemed extremely fit. He didn't seem to be 82 years old at all. He seemed quite a bit younger. I would never have guessed a malignancy was then growing in his abdomen. He is in his third marriage. His children are grown, and his third wife lives in Switzerland, where she writes technical tracts for a large pharmaceutical concern. They communicate by fax. Apparently, she's jealous of me. Jealous of what, exactly, I wonder? I wonder how much she knows. He never put his penis in me. He never put his tongue in my mouth. I cannot even recall his grabbing my small breasts. He has warmed my butt with bells, switches, and his hand. He's put clothespins on my tongue when I talk too much. We had such fun cooking dinners together. Almost always we had bargain basement Spanish sparkling wine, frozen eclairs, London broil, and salads, which he shuddered as he watched me mix, as I never measure the vinaigrette ingredients. But the salad dressing usually comes out just fine anyway. I stress the usually. A fire in the fireplace. Sometimes we'd watch an S&M movie together. How cozy! We certainly didn't date in the normal sense. 
Our goodbye dinner, just before his third marriage in 1985, was at Bill's Gay 90s on 54th Street in Manhattan. The second floor dining room. Fred ordered orange duck, but I was too upset for anything but martinis. I began to cry. I knew I was losing him to his new wife. It was pouring rain outside, and though he sheltered me with his umbrella, by the time we got to the F train, I was half soaked. I don't care, I muttered, turning my back on him and went home, very damp and polyester, to my second husband, hating the world. But I did care. My heart was breaking. Years later, the writer called me and begged me to help him find a job. Why can't you get a job yourself, I asked. You've got an MBA and are a systems analyst with Wall Street experience. I've gotten into junk, he told me flatly. Oh no, I thought. I can't handle this. Not after my first marriage was ruined by that drug. Have you cleaned up, I asked. Pretty much, she said, but sounded alarmingly uncertain. I smoke good quality pot now to get high, he continued. I felt slightly reassured until I saw him in the flesh. I was terribly shocked by his appearance. He was thin as a squirrel and always wore long sleeves to hide his needle marks. He chain smoked and had dark brown teeth stained heavily by tobacco. I got him a job as a word processor in the junk bond department of the brokerage firm that employed me at the time. We'd take lunch breaks together and he'd walk me through Central Park and give me pot to smoke. He was doing his level best to stay away from hard drugs. He'd found a girlfriend. I hear they are now married and have a kid. Six months after I got him the job at, in my department at the brokerage firm, he turned on me. The late night phone calls began, strange voices moaning, you're a cunt. I guess you just can't trust a junkie. The nasty phone calls continued, so often that my answering machine broke. Before things went wrong, I had been visiting the writer's East Village apartment, and I looked up at his ceiling and saw blood up there. How'd that get there? I asked. How do you think? was his only reply. Junkies. I've never been to Planet Junkie myself. Never want to make that trip. I've seen too many people reduced to trash by heroin, so I've never tried it. All right, I would like to repeat that um, I'm doing this series uh, as a result of at least one request that I do so. No edition of this book is authorized. Please don't buy any of them. I do own the correct manuscript and the original photos for this book, which were never used. I have the rights to it all, uh, the original manuscript, uh, manuscript and actually both unauthorized editions are correctly author, uh, copyrighted in my name and I seek a, a, a publisher to do the authorized correct edition of this book, probably with the correct title which was never supposed to be I Was For Sale and um, most likely combined with the parts of the sequel to this book which are finished, which is called The Finishing School, in parentheses, Life is a School, which finishes you off. Um, it's, it has been uh, disturbing to find out that I'm not the only victim of Creation Books, Velvet Books, Green Candy Press, um, James Williamson. I should have been completely relieved, but in fact it just kind of increases the shame and the shock. Um, when you lose control over your artistic work and you put your real name on something, and it's cost you your friends, your family, your career, um, a lot of ridicule problems, and you don't even get paid 
you don't get royalties, you know, the, the work is gone from you, it's sold to other publishers. Um, it's, it's hard to take. Um, now that I get updates in connection with the Creation Books Fraud website, and I see the testimonials of some of the other writers, um, in a way it's a comfort, but it also brings it back again. Um, I think that apparently James Williamson, we don't know his real name, is in Thailand and therefore cannot be prosecuted. But I, I believe we're Mr. Clark and um, we, I haven't really done that much to help, but I hope I can, are trying to find out the real uh, name of James Williamson, where exactly he is. You know, it, it's just been awful trying to get a lawyer to help me with all this since the 90s. You know, creation was supposedly in England, green candy is supposedly in the United States, but in fact I think the guy is Canadian. <coughs> And I live in France, and I'm American also. I have dual nationalities. <coughs> and somebody said to me recently, well, it's an international copyright issue. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Um, I did find one guy named Bob Helms. Uh, I paid him $1,000 to help me with this, and he just basically took the money and didn't do anything and then turned on me. That was horrible. Uh, but um, if, if you don't really know what someone's name is or any actual details about them and you don't know where their assets are and where they are now, especially if it's someplace like Thailand, you know, good luck, right? Good luck with all that. So be very careful. Be well. I'll try to do another installment soon. I've got administrative things to deal with and personal things and business things and health issues and stuff. Okay, bye.